Well, the site, I want to welcome you to Zion's Hope. As you know, you're here. We're continuing our series and our studies on the Open Bible Studio Electives. That's a mouthful. Are you enjoying the teaching so far? Yes. Very good. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of effort going into it, so uh, we appreciate it. Um, this night, I'm going to be taking a look at Isaiah. <clears throat> And we'll be looking at chapters 7 through 11, and uh, that's a mouthful, so don't expect me to dig into every single verse or every single word, although I'd love to, uh, but we would be here a while. I want to focus in on, really, the Emmanuel prophecies. Only one of them has the word Emmanuel in it, actually, but there are three in there that I think are important and you'll recognize them during this time of year. So I said that would be a good topic, but I kind of want to place them in the scope of Isaiah's world and then pull them out to see how it applies to not only the nation Israel, but also to us today, which a lot of times we don't get that perspective. We may get 714 just thrown at us the virgin birth we may get 9 2 the darkness of the land or for the child is born chapter 9 verse 6 but we rarely will get the pig picture so that's what I'm trying to do this evening and hopefully you'll see that if I could if you wouldn't mind open with a brief prayer as we come to God's Word Father God, we come this evening with open minds, with open hearts to receive what you have to say, the truth of your word. Let it penetrate, let it make a difference, and most of all, let us see the Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, God with us. And to you be the praise and glory. Amen. Amen. Now, as we go through these prophecies, I want you to notice one thing as we move from each one you'll notice a progression of information given to us by Isaiah. And so as we go into each prophecy, you get a little bit of information. Then the next one, you get more information, and until the final one, you get a great big package of who the Emmanuel is. Context is very important to be able to understand what's going on in Isaiah's world to be able to interpret this passage properly. I hope you're open now to chapter 7, because we're going to begin and we're going to dig right in. So let's look at the first six verses, if you would. Verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ermalia, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. In other words, they were fearful. Verse 3, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Sheryasab, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted. For these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin in Syria and the son of Ramalia, because Syria Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabel. Pause there. I want you to look at that last verse. It's key in all of this, where they were planning to set a king over them, the son of Tabel. And the son of Tabal is a Syrian name. Now let me show you kind of what's going on here in sort of a picture format. We have here Israel and Syria, and I have them joined together. You heard the name Rezin, didn't you? The king of 
Syria. You heard the name Pekah, the king of Israel. Ahaz, of course, is down in Judah. The two tribes, Israel, the northern tribes, and the southern tribes, Judah. They had split hundreds of years earlier than that. What is happening, and I made this box bigger because they're, big, they're a big nation, the Assyrian Empire was starting to grow and get larger and larger, and they were becoming a threat in the Middle East. They're about ready and were even starting to make a move down towards the Middle East, towards Israel, Syria, and Judah. What Israel and Syria did is they joined together and made an alliance. They figured if we had more than one nation, we could fight off the Assyrians and perhaps be victorious. They said, well, we could use help. So they go to Ahaz down in Judah and they ask for help. He says no. He says no, because he had other plans. And if you look in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, you'll find out his other plans were to circle back up to Assyria and make a deal with them on the side. Well, that didn't work out, but we're not going there. But he says no to them, which starts in our history books, the Syro-Ephraimite War, meaning Syria and Ephraim, which is another name for Israel, are going to attack Judah. So this is well-documented war. Go to any encyclopedia and you'll find it. So we know the dates, 734 to 732. So when we hear that Ahaz is going down to the aqueduct, he's probably preparing for war. And so the year is approximately 734 B.C. What we're going to find out in all of this is that there's an imminent threat from Israel and Syria and Assyria. We find out that Ahaz will not trust God. He will not trust God because that's what's going to be thrown at Ahaz to trust God. We'll find out that God will bring judgment to this unbelief. We will see that God promises a Messiah. And here's where the Emmanuel prophecies will all fit in. In this whole picture, as God brings judgment, as Ahaz is an un, comes to God in unbelief, God is going to make the promise of the Messiah, the promise of that Emmanuel. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact that this is a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle, much like what happens in the world today. We need to use our spiritual eyes and see the spiritual battles going on today. The battles in the Middle East are no different today. We can watch them. Yes, there's people doing the, doing the war and doing the killing, but it's a spiritual battle. And it goes all the way back to the garden. But we see God addressing the serpent, Satan, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Let the battle begin. The seed is capitalized because ultimately the seed is Christ. And the one thing that Satan doesn't want, he doesn't want that seed to come about. And that's what's happening here with Ahaz. Because I had you focus in on verse 6 that said, we will make a king and set him over the son of Tabal. In other words, we're going to eliminate the king of Judah with a Syrian king. How will that fit into God's plan of redemption if we no longer have a Judean king? Because in Genesis 49.10, God says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Do you see the battle that's about to begin? It's a spiritual one. That's going on behind the scenes. And not only that, in 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13, we see the Davidic line promise. The throne of David will continue. He says, I will set up your seed, speaking to David. I will set up your seed, and down here, establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. Forever. Satan is making a very strong effort in our history here of Isaiah to try and thwart God's plan by eliminating the uh, line, lineage of David and Judah. What do you think God has to say about that? <laughs> Look at verse 7. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. 
made it quite clear to Ahaz, quite clear to us, that God's plans will come about no matter what man plans to do or Satan plans to do. Well, let's look at how Ahaz responds to that. We would hope that he would say, okay, let's go with it. But listen what he says in verse, let's jump down to verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in a depth or in the height above. In other words, ask anything you want. Wouldn't you love that? Whatever you want, just ask it. You want, you want me to prove who I am? You want me to prove my message is true? Ask anything. Who else got that kind of uh, offer? But Ahaz said, I will not. I underlined just those three words. I said, wow. God said, ask. He said to God Almighty, I will not. How dare him say that? A direct command. Nor I won't ask, nor will I test the Lord. In other words, he's rebelling. He's rejecting God. He's not trusting in God at all. It's going to be a turning point. I think, in the history of the nation of Israel. God had said up ahead, he said, ask for yourself personally. What kind of a sign do you want? But I want you to see God's response in verse 13 continues. I can just put myself there in Isaiah's shoes and hear in this. Then he said, hear now, O house of David. I'm sure it was much louder than that. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but you will weary my God also? Therefore, here's the Emmanuel verse, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. How many times have we heard that verse? I've heard, seen it on so many cards. But what is God communicating here in this situation? Let's take a look at verses 13 and 14 together. Remember I said the offer was to Ahaz. He said, ask yourself. But God's response is interesting if we look at it. Because it's the Messiah's virgin birth. And we see God addressing the house of David. The entire throne the entire line was wearying God out, was wearing on his patience, their disbelief in what God had to say. But an interesting thing, in the Hebrew anyway, the word you. I put it in yellow so you could see. The small thing for you, plural. Who's he talking to? Ahaz. You, weary my God. Here, you shall give you, plural. That's a clue for us. It tells us that this message is not just for Ahaz alone. This message it goes beyond Ahaz, goes beyond him to the entire throne, and perhaps even out to the whole entire nation. And so he changes this to the plural, a message to the entire line. I was trying to think if we had any English words that could be plural, you. I knew there's some southern people here. Anybody from New York? Use okay. Anybody from Pittsburgh? Oh, I didn't know. What? No, that's Ohio. Yints. Anybody ever hear of Yints? Y I N Z? Okay, you got something new tonight. But anyway, if you had a southern translation, you could put y'all in there, and we would catch on real quick. But he's talking beyond Ahaz himself. And he's talking to the people. So this is a message not just for Ahaz in his current place and time. It goes beyond that. And we need to capture that sense. The next thing I want you to see in this is behold. See that word there? Very important word. Some of these little words are important. Behold. God uses that to introduce quite often something extraordinary, important, at noteworthy, even miraculous. You'll see it pop up when God says, hey, pay attention here. So we need to follow what's coming behind this. And we will see, a virgin shall conceive. Something is important about that verse. Now I put in the Hebrew word, Alma, so we could see that. 
But the sense of this verse is that a virgin shall give birth and conceive a child and he shall be called Emmanuel. And there's a miraculous sense to that. Something miraculous with this child. A virgin having a child would be extraordinary, would it not? Some people will want to argue that that doesn't mean virgin. And they'll go to that. I'm sure you've heard the arguments go on and on. You know, sometimes maybe it meant young woman. It didn't actually mean virgin. So if you take a study of the word, you'll go to Genesis chapter 24, 43. You look at it, it's talking about Rebecca. Rebecca, that's Isaac's wife, searching for her. It calls her an Alma. It calls her a virgin. I'm on board with that, right? But then we go down to Exodus chapter 2, verse 8. We see the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go, she's talking to Moses' sister. Go and the maid, Alma. So now we've got a different interpretation. So what does that tell us? It tells us the word Alma can be translated either way and is not definitive of the word virgin. So where do we go from here? Well, we'll go and talk about the Septuagint. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Septuagint. It is the Hebrew text that has been translated into Greek. About 250 B.C., they noticed that the people were not understanding the Hebrew because of the Greek language had been spreading so much, and they wanted the people, they wanted to be able to talk to them in the language they were speaking of that day. So the Hebrew scholars of the day, the Jews, the scribes, the teachers, all the guys who would know, they got together, about 70 of them, the Septuagint, 70, LXX, Roman numeral 4, 70. Uh, they got together and they decided on how the text would be presented. In particular, they came across the Old Testament. And in our case, they came across Isaiah 7, verse 14. Now remember, this is only 480 years after Isaiah, so it's not far away. It's also 250 years before the birth of Christ. So they wouldn't have that baggage or background when they're translating. Although I think if they did, they might have translated it different on purpose. But when we look at this text, we'll see how the Jewish scholars and experts thought Isaiah and what he meant. So when we look at it, guess what they do? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold the virgin, they translated it Pathanos, which means virgin. The Greek's a little more specific. When you say Parthenos, you mean a woman who hasn't had sex. We can verify that even further when we go back to the verse we just looked at with Moses' sister, look what it calls her. It translates the word Alma into Neanus, which means young lady. So they knew what they were doing when they chose words. So these 70 experts in Jewish language, Hebrew, purposely picked the word Parthenos, which means a virgin. In other words, there's no doubt in their mind that Isaiah meant a woman who had not been with a man was going to have a child. If that's not enough, we can look forward to Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, familiar passage. So this was all done and it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. We know the prophet's name, Isaiah. Behold, the virgin Parthenaos shall be with child. Matthew under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, continues using the word virgin. So for all those who say it should be young woman, they have another agenda, and we'd probably use another Greek word called baloney. <laughs> but don't look that up. I don't, I'm not sure if that's anywhere. But anyway, you, you, you do see it one English language text that does put in young woman. You know who wants it to be young woman? The Islamic people. Do you know that they call this young woman, behold, the young woman shall be with child. Do you know they call that Muhammad as the child? And they claim that verse for him. 
But when we go to calling it properly a virgin, it's a whole other story because there's no way Muhammad was born of a virgin. Well, that's the message given to Ahaz, and he had rejected it. There are consequences to saying no to God. Did you know that? <laughs> Try it. In other words, unbelief, lack of trust, has a consequence. Look at verse 17 of chapter 7. He tells them, The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. What's going to happen? Assyria, the big red box I had there before, they're going to come down. And they're going to destroy and ransack and ravage over Judah. The one they turn to for help is going to turn on them. And it will all be God's doing. Well, much of chapter 7 and then into chapter 8 talk about this invasion. I'll let you read that on your own. And you can see how bad this invasion is going to be and the consequences that they pay for rejecting God. I want you to turn, though, to the end of chapter 8, beginning in verse 21. It's the preparation for the next Emmanuel verse. It tells us the condition of the people. The condition of the people. In other words, the nation. In verse 21, they will pass through it hard-pressed. This is talking about the people of Judah. They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry. It shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God. And look upward. That's what happens when people get angry at God. They disobey God and they look upward and they say, Why, God, are you letting this happen to me? Same things happen to the people here. They're blaming God for their misery when it's in fact their own sinful response. We can't put all the blame on Ahaz because if you look at the condition of the people in the first five chapters, you'll see they are very, very wicked. Ahaz is just leading them into God's judgment. <clears throat> Verse 22, Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Oh, do we have a picture of a sinful person mired in their sin? It's a dark world they're in. There's no light. There's gloom. That's where the people are in that time of Judah. If I could bring that forward, I think that's where we are now as a country. They need help. They need a Savior, don't they? I'm glad it continues with chapter 9. How does chapter 9 start? Nevertheless. nevertheless, another great word, isn't it? Because nevertheless can mean something good's about to happen or something bad's about to happen. God has used that either way, but hold your breath. See which one he wants. Well, we're getting prepared for the next prophecy, number two, the Messiah. Both God and man. Both God and man. This will shock them. Not only is born of a virgin, remember we're building? The virgin child is going to be God and he's going to be a man at the same time. Nevertheless, that I wrote mercy and grace right next to that one word. Mercy and grace. Did they do anything to deserve this nevertheless? No. They were walking cursing God. But nevertheless, God is going to send them a son. Despite this darkness. Look what it says. Let's read the first two verses. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward, going more heavily, oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people, is the verse you'll note, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You love that verse? I have a Christmas card at home that has on that. We know in this time in New Testament ages that we know who the light is. Who's the light? It's none other than the virgin born Emmanuel, the light of the world who will come in. 
mean, Matthew knew that. When, he, when we look at his prophecy, Matthew picks right up on this verse. He's quoting Isaiah. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. He applied that to the people of his world then. We're in the same situation. Matthew is quoting this right at the time that Christ is going out to, this, to his missionary field of the Gentiles in the region of Galilee. I would ask you that this verse also applies to us today. When we go out and we preach to the people around us, the darkness is there. We can see it. But the light is still there also. And that light is shining. Look at verse 3. You have multiplied the nation, increased its joy. There's great joy over this light being shined in their vicinity, in their world, in their nation, in their life. A light is shining and there's joy. Remember the first time you were saved and the joy? I hope you haven't lost it. But the joy that you have in all of this, oh, it's Christmas time. You love it? I get tired of the lights. I get tired of the trees. and It's nice and cute, but the joy of Christ's coming should never go away. The light has come into the world. And these people are joyous. Go down to verse 6. You see the word for. That tells us, here's the reason they're so joyous. For unto us a child is born. That's the virgin birth. A child is born. That's also the incarnation. That's Christmas. That's the child coming into this world in human form. That's the man. Jesus Christ coming as a boy. And look what it says, unto us, us, for us, to us, to be with us. That's Emmanuel. That's Emmanuel coming to us. A son is given, not earned, not merited, but given the gift of Jesus Christ spelled out to us. What a great day, what a great time. Continue on, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name. Now we have some names that he's called. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We have four names thrown in there. We won't take the time, but if you study them, they're all named titles of God. They're titles of God. They belong to a divine person. Wonderful Counselor means wonder. Supernatural Counselor. Mighty God, we can interpret that easily. Everlasting Father, the eternal nature of this person that is belonging to this child, the Prince of Peace, the only one that can reconcile the differences between humanity and God Himself. Of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. There's the promise. Ah, you think you're going to do away with the throne? You think you're going to do away with the scepter of Judah? No. Here's your promise, Israel. It'll never, never end. Upon the throne of David over his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Not man, this will be God himself will perform this miracle. A virgin birth, a light, a child born and given, a child who is God and a man, and a, he's a man and a ruler. Well, chapter 9 in verse 8, continues on all the way to 10.4. We have more punishment going on to the nation Israel. I thought about that. So why did, Israel, why did Isaiah put more punishment in there after declaring the child? And I'm like, hmm, I wonder if it has anything to do with the Jewish nation rejecting the Savior at the time and getting punished further on. And perhaps Isaiah is giving us a hint in this little section. Well, there's more. Chapter 10, verse 5, if you'll turn over to there. And then we'll scoot down to verse 12. So we'll do 1, verse 5, and then 12. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. Scoot down to verse 12. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, who's doing the work? The Lord is doing the work. 
I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. God's going to punish Assyria. Well, I thought Assyria was his tool. How often do you look at your hoe and that you use to hoe the grass and said, bad hoe. But we're not talking about tools or implements. We're talking about people and nations. God can use anybody to punish anybody. He can use a sinful nation or a good nation. God is God and he's sovereign in that area. But he's holding everybody responsible for their own sins. That's what we hear here. Syria has a proud and arrogant heart. When you read that description and that language, my mind goes to the person or the spirit of Satan. I think of the passage, and Isaiah will get to it in chapter 14. We won't go there tonight when he talks about the pride and the arrogance of Lucifer. As I, we talk about end times a lot. We always look in one area for where the Antichrist will come. And it's very possible he'll come up from somewhere in the Assyrian Empire. See how nothing changes? Perhaps God has given us a hint of how we will punish the Assyrian, which Micah talks about in his passage. But here God is talking about punishing Assyria, and he goes on about that in that passage. Interestingly, in verse 20, if you look down there, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. I want you to look in those two verses, and what you see here is a couple of interesting things. He highlights and identifies this remnant that's going to come back. And he uses the remnant of Israel and the remnant of Jacob. In other words, he's including both houses of Israel, the southern and the northern. And he's very specifically talking about the nation Israel. I mean, God has a plan for his nation Israel. That's why we're passionate here at Zion's Hope that that message goes out. God's not done with Israel. He's not done. All these people, and there's a growing trend that, no, God... God did not replace Israel with the church. Otherwise, he's got to rewrite Isaiah, which makes him very specific. He says, here, there will be a remnant that will come about. And if you look at Zechariah, you will see the remnant. He talks about a remnant coming out of Israel that will be saved. We're seeing the same message here. Let's go down to verse 33. This will bring us into the context for the next and last passage. Verse 33, talking about Assyria now, because this passage is talking about the judgment on Assyria. It starts off with the word, behold. Again, we talked about that, an amazing little word, something remarkable is going to happen. Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Assyria. He's talking about that mighty tree, that mighty tree that's coming down against Israel. God's going to cut it off and make a stump out of it. That leads us right into the next passage here in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 11. And is going to bring us into the next prophecy, the Messiah, the rules over a new kingdom. See how we've progressed from just one verse in chapter 7, the virgin birth, to several verses in chapter 9, the child who is going to be a man and God is going to rule. And now we come to chapter 11, which talks about the same Emmanuel, this same child, except now it broadens the teaching. And he's actually talking about what period of time? The millennial period. The thousand year reign of Christ will occur during this time. And we can learn some information about that period. In 11, verse 1, There shall come from a forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. There's a direct comparison here between that and the previous verse. God's cutting down Assyria, the enemies of Israel, 
and he's going to bring out from the remnant, from the stump, he's going to bring out a root. And he calls this root or the stem of Jesse. Well, we know who that is. That's Jesus Christ. It's very interesting that this, he's called the stem of Jesse. I pondered that and I said, why is he not the son of David? Of course, he's called the son of David. But he's called here the stem of Jesse. And look over to verse 10, same chapter. In that day, there'll be a root of Jesse. A root. Is there a difference between a root and a stem? Yeah. I had to go to my biology books, and yes, in fact, the root's underground and su supplies the source and everything else, and the stem's up above. It's the benefactor of the root. And I thought about that. I, that's pretty cool. Christ is the source, and he is the benefactor. He is doing it all, in other words. Why did he not use David? Perhaps because he's another David. He is going to be a, a rule similar to the original David. So, and he's different than all the other kings. No other king was called a stem or a root of Jesse. It only applies to Christ. As we continue on, we'll find something else out about this. In Romans chapter 15, Paul applies this to Jesus Christ himself. If you look at chapter 15, it's all about Jesus Christ. And he says, aha, here he is. Isaiah said, this is a root of Jesse. He will rise over the Gentiles, and in him the Gentiles will have hope. Paul makes it very clear. That root you saw back in Isaiah, this passage, that's Jesus. Pay, pay attention. Verse 2, we learn something else about this Messiah, Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. I wish I had time to expound on that. But walk away with this. The Spirit of God of mighty, the Spirit of the Lord will so overwhelm Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He will be divinely appointed and empowered like no other leader was ever for Israel. John saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. Didn't come and go like a lot of other people in the Bible, but he remained, he rested upon him. Jesus Christ, when he began his ministry, he said this in the temple in Capernaum. He said, the Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me. He declared that. Why? Because he wanted everyone to know, this is me. Pay attention. I'm the one the Bible talking about. Well, it goes on, and we're going to have to pick it up a little more quickly here. If we look at verse 3, in the middle of it, it says, He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. He's not going to look at somebody or listen to somebody. This is a ruler that you don't have to talk. He's going to be able to look right into you. Revelation chapter 2, verse 23, the second part, I am he who searches the minds and hearts. That's pretty cool. No pulling anything over on this ruler. He sees your heart. I mean, it's pretty scary right now. In my sinful condition, I'm not sure I want him there, although I know he's there, but I try to hide it, and you know how that all works. But he's, you're going to have a ruler that I say is going to have absolute justice demands absolute knowledge. Absolute justice demands absolute knowledge. That's speaking of Christ himself. As we continue, I want you to look at verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the loin shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. We're describing a different world than the one we live in today. It's one where there'll be complete harmony and peace between man, animal. There will be something remarkable happening to this planet. A lot of people say it can't happen because animals are bred and they got instinct to kill. Well, you know what? God's going to change all of that. My God can do any of all of that. The world is corrupted. We know that. Romans 8. Creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. I think we're seeing it here in this passage right here. It's going to be delivered. Let's go down to verse 10. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, 
who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. This new world, this new place, will be a place where Gentiles will come and seek God, and seek the ruler, and the Christ, and, the, and who he is. In chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, we're talking about the Jewish people. I won't read them. The Jewish people, the remnant, they're going to be gathered from the entire planet and they're going to come back and they're going to sit under the rule of Jesus Christ. In chapter verse 13, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 13, we'll note here that there's going to be unified Israel. The north and the south will no longer be at odds. They won't envy one another. They will be unified as a nation. And then in verse 14 through 16, we see the nation Israel taking back its land. The land promise. If you look at the, if you look at the nations that they're battling against and that they're beating, they happen to be the same nations that David, King David himself in 2 Samuel conquered the lands. I believe what's happening here is they are getting the final promised land that Israel, that God has promised to them. Now, I know that was very quick, but I do want to sum it up with a couple things, and i got a couple minutes. When we look at these passages, I gave you this, the text. We'll see the virgin birth, supernatural, of course. We see the Messiah as being both God and man. We see a supernatural ruler and a new type of kingdom. We come to one conclusion in our day and age, and we know who that is. It's the Emmanuel, the God with us. It's Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Well, I looked at that and I stepped back a minute and I said, let's look at the big picture. And as I do, I kind of notice this down, the big picture. Chapter 7, that's what's on the left. The promise of a virgin birth to an unbelieving world. We see that right from the get-go. Followed by judgment against unbelief. Followed by a child born into darkness to bring light, followed by the oppressor is punished for his pride. Chapter 11, a ruler will come to a gathered remnant, the nation Israel, and a millennial kingdom will be established. All that in chapter 7 through 11. It looks like the plan of redemption, does it not? Starting with unbelief. So when you see these verses pop up, I want you to think, there's a much bigger plan than just the birth of a child. The birth of a child is great, but it's only a piece of the big plan of redemption, not only for the nation of Israel, but also for us as benefactors of that. So what do we do with this? Well, we do the same thing that they did in chapter 12. Because chapter 12 is part of this package deal. And it only has two points. Let's go to verse 2. Behold! You're going to know that word after tonight. <laughs> something new, something great, something noteworthy. What is it? God is my salvation. Not God will save me. That word God is within him himself is the whole plan of redemption. He is Jesus Christ. He is my God. He is the Spirit. He is my Savior. He is salvation. He sums it up. How do I respond? I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, that's the abbreviated form of Yahweh. For Yah, the Lord, that's the long form of the name Yahweh, is my strength and song. He has also become, not only is, he became my salvation. How did he become? Through repentance and prayer and coming before him, calling upon him. Now, Isaiah didn't put any of that in this text. He will later in some of his passage. Right now he wants to have you see the source of that salvation. Verse 4, one last response. In that day, what day? When the Lord does all of these things, when the millennial kingdom is established, when everything is just the way he wants it. Verse 4, praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name, declare his deeds among the peoples, make mention, ready, that his name is exalted. Everything about him is lifted up in praise. 
we can take those two verses out of chapter 12 and use them to tell other people about Christ. When we see the message coming through the Christmas verses, and they're all great, remember it's a package deal. Isaiah gave us the whole plan, but he gave us the conclusion and the response. We all here need to trust him. We all need to trust him more. We all need to declare him. We all need to talk about him and how great he is and how wonderful he is. And so I pray that you will do that this Christmas. I pray that you will all have a blessed Christmas and a blessed New Year. It's been a pleasure to be with you tonight. And uh, let me just close with a, just, a few, just a short little prayer before Mike gets ready to come up. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Emmanuel that came to save us. We thank you for the plan of redemption. Lord, let us go out into this world. You are our salvation. And Lord, take it to heart. We will declare you to the ends of our world and tell others about your name, the exalted one, the high Lord above lords, the king above kings. We thank you, Lord, for your son, the gift, and to you be the glory. Amen.